So what I'm going to do right now is do what's called with grain reading. What that means is for the first time I read something, I'm going to just separate myself from the author and biases and so forth. I'm just trying to get meaning from what the author is trying to say, but I'm going to reserve any judgment about what he says until after I've gotten through the complete article. So what I'm going to do now is called read aloud. And it's a method whereby um, we can make sense of what we're reading. So I will be starting this article and you will be finishing it in a likewise manner. So let's go ahead and start with the first couple of paragraphs. Some of the obituaries these days aren't in the newspapers, but are for the newspapers. The C Seattle Post Intelligencer is the last to pass away save for the remnant that will exist only in cyberspace, and the public is increasingly seeking its news not from mainstream television networks or ink on dead trees, but from grazing online. When we go online, each of us is our own editor, our own gatekeeper. We select the kind of news and opinions that we care most about. Nicholas Negroponte of MIT has called this emerging news product the Daily Me. And if that's the trend, God save us from ourselves. So at first, the tone seems light because he's using these clever little word plays like ink on dead trees and, and that obituaries are for newspapers and not for people. Um, but then uh, he gets serious because when he comes down to God save us from ourselves, that definitely changes the tone. Um, is he joking? Uh, what does he mean by that? Then in paragraph two, he says the daily me allows people to choose the news they care about. So I think the term daily me means any online news that you can pick and choose according to your tastes. I'm not sure why he's worried about that yet, uh, but I will keep reading just to see what his reasons are. So moving on to paragraphs four and five. That's because there's pretty good evidence that we generally truly want good information, but rather information that confirms our prejudices. We may believe intellectually in the clash of opinions, but in practice, we like to embed ourselves in the reassuring womb of an echo chamber. That's interesting, echo chamber. <clears throat> Uh, one classic study sent mailings to Republicans and Democrats, offering them various kinds of political research, ostensibly from a neutral source. Both groups were most eager to receive intelligent articles that strongly corroborated the pre-existing views. So looking at these two paragraphs, I have to clarify some word meanings, starting with we. So. Um, how has he identified his audience here? And I think at this point he means everybody because um, this is talking about anybody who's going to get information from any source. I think he's referring to everybody uh, is like this. Um, I think good information or good evidence means accurate information, the, the truth, what is real. Uh, when he says that we like information that confirms our prejudice, I don't think he means the hatred toward a group. Um, he's talking about information that supports our opinions that we already hold. So in paragraph four, he's basically saying that if you give people the choice, they will choose to read information that supports them rather than information that challenges them. So he makes a big claim here. So in paragraph five, he offers the experiment of the Republicans and Democrats um, as evidence for that. Paragraph six and seven. There was also a modest interest in receiving manifestly silly arguments for the other party's views. We feel good when we can caricature, caricature the other guy's stances. This reminds me a lot of Saturday Night Live. That's what they do all the time. But there was little interest in encountering solid arguments that might undermine one's own opinion. The general finding has been replicated re repeatedly, as the essayist and author Farhad Manshu noted in his terrific book last year, True Enough, 
learning to live in a post-fact society. So paragraph six is still connected to four and five. Um, in five, it talked about how both Democrats and Republicans liked reading strong arguments that supported their existing opinions. So paragraph six now adds two more angles on the same idea. Both Republicans and Democrats also liked reading silly arguments in support of the other party's opinions. And they did not like reading solid arguments that challenged their views. Basically, it sounds like people aren't interested in changing their minds. Paragraph seven suggests there is a lot more research that got the same type of results. Christoph doesn't include any of that research, but he does offer the book where I can find it. Um, so I do wonder about the title of the book. What does post-fact society mean? That there is no such thing as fact anymore? Or given what this text is talking about, maybe it's suggesting our society doesn't care about facts anymore. Paragraph eight. Let me get one thing out of the way. I'm sometimes guilty myself of selective truth-seeking on the web. The blog I turn to for insight into Middle East news is often Professor Juan Coles because he's smart, well-informed, and sensible. In other words, I often agree with his take. I'm less likely to peruse the blog of Daniel Pipes, another Middle East expert who is smart and well-informed, but who strikes me as less sensible, partly because I often disagree with them. So in this paragraph, he admits that he also has preferences for information that lines up with what he already thinks. It's interesting because normally admitting that might what might hurt somebody's credibility, but here it's like he's saying, I'm just like all those Republicans and Democrats. It keeps him from sounding like he thinks he's better than everyone else. I think it actually helps his credibility and it's supporting his argument at the same time. Okay, nine and 10. The effect of the daily me would be to isolate us further in our own hermetically sealed pol political chambers. One of last year's more fascinating books was Bill Bishop's The Big Sword, Why the Clustering of Like-Minded America is Tearing Us Apart. He argues that Americans increasingly are segregating themselves into communities, clubs, and churches where they are surrounded by people who think the way they do. Almost half of Americans now live in countries that vote in landslides, either for Democrats or for Republicans, he said. In the 1960s and 70s, in similarly competitive national elections, only about one third lived in landslide counties. So this is a change in direction. Up through paragraph eight, the author was describing how people like confirming their own biases. But this paragraph moves to talk about the effects of it. He cites a book that argues Americans are surrounding themselves with people who think the same, and he believes that the daily me, which is the personalized news, the things that confirm what you already know, will insulate us and uh, even further from people with different viewpoints. So now what you wanna do is read the rest of the article in the same way I did. Take it paragraph by paragraph or two paragraphs at a time and think your way through it. Uh, notice the checklist that you were given and see what you can come up with as you read through the rest of this article.